Okay, let's get started. Welcome everyone. I've written some words for the lunch. So welcome everybody to this lecture by Professor Erika Fudge. The lecture is part of the Sterling Science Festival. It has been organized by the Interdisciplinary Research Project, ARED, which stands for Agency Rationality and Epistemic Defeat. ARED is a collaboration between philosophers, developmental psychologists, and cognitive ethologists at the universities of Sterling and Vienna. It investigates the relation between human and animal rationality and cognition. And it is supported by UKRI through the Future Leaders Fellowship Scheme. Now, while philosophy, developmental psychology, and animal cognition are the core disciplines in the project, we do have the ambition to engage with other disciplines with an interest in the relation between human and animal minds and intelligence. Professor Erika Fudge is one of the most prominent scholars on the topic in the field of historical and literary studies. She's the director of the British Animal Studies Network and author of several books and articles on the relation between human and non-human animals with a special focus on the early modern period. I am especially excited about this lecture because Erika's critical discussion of the view that humans are the only rational animals, as articulated in works like Brutal Reasoning, is as relevant for modern versions of the view as it is for contemporary ones. One of the things that Erika notes in Brutal Reasoning is that an important source of humans' interest towards animals lies in the desire to understand human nature by way of comparison. As a philosopher, I've been aware of this in the first person for a while. But it wasn't until I read Brutal Reasoning that I realized how deep-rooted this sentiment has been throughout Western thought and culture. Brutal Reasoning is a book from which anyone interested in how humans think of animals in the early modern period, as well as today, and indeed in antiquity, will have something to learn. It shows how big an oversimplification it is to describe early modern people as endorsing the dichotomy between humans as rational and animals as non-rational. It also discusses some issues that are still very much alive in the current philosophical and psychological study of animal minds. I want to mention a few of them very, very quickly. One is the developmental question. When does a rational subject become rational? In particular, advocates of the view that rationality is an exclusive prerogative of humans may have to assign a crucial role to education in accounting for the transition to becoming a rational subject. Brutal reasoning emphasizes how doing so is in tension with the idea that all humans are rational in a timeless historical sense. Another theme still very much alive concerns the role of observation of animal behavior as a basis for hypotheses about the nature of animal minds. Brutal reasoning shows how this was the norm until the car defended human exceptionalism on purely a priori grounds. It is striking that today, even philosophers who defend the uniqueness of human rationality citing Aristotle rather than Descartes as their inspiration, tend to adopt an anti empiricist stance. And of course, this methodological stance is challenged by friends of animal rationality, so to say. Yet another point that emerges clearly in brutal reasoning and is still relevant today is how some thinkers like Montaigne challenge the idea of the separation of reason and instinct and the supremacy of the former. This is an issue central, for example, in, in Mary Midgley's influential work, in particular in her book of Beast and Man. As I said, the, these are just a few examples. Brutal reasoning is brimming with themes and reflections that a contemporary philosopher or scientist working on the relation between human and animal minds would find insightful and instructive. Before leaving the floor to Eric, I wish to close with a general consideration. Contemporary philosophers who think that only humans can act and form beliefs in a rational way tend to argue that only humans have the capacity for reflection. Reflection is often seen as the core of rationality, and it ends up playing a role very similar to Aristotle's rational soul or to Descartes' soul simplicity. This commonality of roles makes engaging with Erika's critical discussion of the reception of the Aristotelian and Cartesian views in the early modern period especially rewarding and, and uh, fruitful today. But now it's time to enjoy the lecture. And I shall let Thank you very much.
is you're about to see are chosen randomly. You can ask me about them and I will be able to say, I've put their titles on the shot slide. I thought you might like some pictures. That's why they're there. So imagine the scene. This is Cambridge University in March 1615 and everyone is preparing for the arrival of James the Sixth and First. A series of Latin plays are lined up to entertain him, comedies with their classical roots showing so that His Majesty remembers how educated as well as witty his or the authors are. But the university's senior management team aren't satisfied. They decide that something else is needed, that staging a device will be the perfect addition. It will allow the king to witness the learning in a more serious context. But Vice Chancellor and former revealer of fake exorcists, Samuel Harsnett, is having a difficulty. Both of the scholars who've been invited to engage in the debate, that is John Preston, a Puritan divine, writer of religious ideas, and Matthew Wren, fellow and future master of Pembroke College, both of them want to take on the role of answerer and not opponent. It's the opponent's role to begin the debate. The answerer answers his opponent what his opponent has put to him. Preston had originally been offered the answerer role, but apparently took too long to get back to Harsnett, so the role was offered to Wren, who immediately said yes. As Thomas Ball, one of Preston's pupils, recorded 12 years after the event, the vice chancellor, quote, endeavored to reconcile Preston to the first opponent's role place which he declined as being too obnoxious to the answerer, who is indeed the lord and ruler of the act. Obnoxious here doesn't mean not disagreeable, as we might use the term today, but rather means liable or exposed to harm. That is, I take it, the ball is recording Preston's fears that he would be shown up by the answerer in this very public debate with only a limited right of reply. Despite this, however, Parsnet held firm, Ball goes on, there was no removing Wren, and so Preston goes about it with much unwillingness, being driven rather than drawn onto it. It's very familiar university life, it's not a very auspicious beginning. The staging of a debate such as this was an opportunity for the scholars to show off their rhetorical skills. This wasn't a case of finding two people who genuinely held opposing beliefs, rather the debate was a formulaic exercise in persuasion, using logic, rhetorical technique, classical precedent. One might be debating, for example, whether women had souls or not, and an argument for or against would be proposed by each of the speakers. What you actually believed was not the point. What you had to do was display your capacity to argue the case you had been asked to put. The debate being staged for James was deliberately chosen in the hope that it would be of interest to the monarch. He was well known to be a fanatical huntsman, and thus, in honour of his presence, the debate that Preston and Wren would engage in was titled, Whether Dogs Could Make Syllogisms. That is, whether dogs can perform logical deductions. In a piece in a 2008 essay collection called What Philosophy Can Tell You About Your Dog, American philosopher Andrew Aberdeen describes the syllogism as follows. He says it is a combined reasoning, a derivation of one statement, the conclusion, from two others, the premises. The major premise, which characters, I'm quoting from Andrew Aberdeen, the major premise, uh, which characteristically makes the more general claim, is that that conventionally given first, the one, the other is termed the minor prayers. The logicians, he goes on, are primarily concerned with valid syllogisms in which the truth of the premises guarantees the truth of the conclusion. Or as Aristotle stated in the prior analytics, a syllogism is speech in which certain things having been supposed, something different from those supposed results of necessity, something different from those supposed, re supposed sorry, results from of necessity because of their being so. Aberdeen, whose essay is entitled Logic for Dogs, gives a <laughs> appropriately canine <laughs> example. All pointers are gun dogs, major premise. All Vimaramas are pointers, minor premise. Therefore, all Vimaramas are gun dogs. Conclusion. That is a syllogism. Now, this syllogism would have been utterly inexplicable to James and his court because the breed of hunting dogs we call Vimaramas first appeared in the early 19th century. But other 
examples that might have been recognised. This is a, an early modern dog. James, um, a familiar one from the schoolroom in the period would have been, all men are mortal, Aristotle is a man, therefore Aristotle is mortal. Or we could go to Shakespeare's Time and Athens, a play written just a few years before James's Cambridge visit, to find the title character expressing his misanthropy in the form of a syllogism. I have forgot all men, then if thou grantst thou art a man, I have forgot thee. How can a dog possibly be said to perform such an act of logical deduction? This was what John Preston, the unwilling opponent in the debate, had to persuade his audience. Now, in fact, he had a well-known classical precedent for this, an anecdote from the third century of the Christian era Greek philosopher Chrysippus um, is central to the way he presented his argument. Here is Michel de Montaigne, who Guillermo mentioned his, his rendition of the tale of Chrysippus's dog that he has in his extended essay, An Apology for Raymond Sibon from 1580. And I'm quoting from Montaigne. Chrysippus, albeit in other things as disdainful a judge of the condition of beasts as any other philosopher, considering the earliest movings of the dog who coming into a path that led three several ways in search or quest of his master, whom he had lost or in pursuit of some prey that had escaped him, goeth scenting the fir first one way, then another, and having assured himself of the two, because he findeth not the track of what he hunteth for, without much ado, furiously take betakes himself to the third. He, Chrysippus, is enforced to confess that such a dog must necessarily discourse thus with himself. So the dog must think to himself, I have followed my master's footing hitherto. He must of necessity pass by one of these three ways. It is neither this way nor that, then consequently he has gone the other. By this conclusion, Montaigne goes on, or discourse assuring himself, coming to the third path, he useth his sense no more, nor sounds it any longer, but by the power of his reason, suffers himself violently to be carried through it. The, this mere logical trick and this use of divided and conjoined propositions and of the sufficient numbering of parts, is it not as good that the dog know it by himself as by Trapezuntius, his logic? Trapezuntius is a 15th century translator of Aristotle. So we have this story of Chrysippus's dog, this dog that by sniffing one way, sniffing another way, and then running the third way without making any more sniffing, has made Montaigne, following Crispus argues, a logical deduction. Thomas Ball's rendition of Preston's use of Crispus at Cambridge University is rather less detailed. He writes, he instanced a hound who hath the major proposition in his mind, namely, the hare is gone either this way or that way, smells out the minor with his nose, namely, she is not gone that way, and follows the conclusion, ergo, this way, with mouth open, that is, without sniff. In response to Preston presenting him with this evidence for canine logic, Matthew Wren, the answerer, made a simple and very philosophically orthodox claim. He argued dogs use their skills of smelling rather than region, reason, or in his terms, nasu truly, but not logically. They had, he said, much in their minds, so much in their mouths, little in their minds. So they were sniffing and not thinking. Preston, the opponent, would not be silenced by Wren's response and began to offer more evidence to support his case. But according to Ball's record of the event, Dr. Reed, the moderator of the discussion, quote, began to be afraid and to think how troublesome a pack of hounds well followed and applauded at last might prove. And so came in unto the answerers that is Wren's aid and told the opponent that his dogs, he believed, were very weary and desired him to take them off. And when the opponent would not yield, but hallowed still and put them on, he interposed his authority and silenced him. So Preston used his anger well. That's not the end of the story of this debate. In fact, the story becomes more interesting at this point because it's now that James, instead of sitting quietly and rejoicing in the erudition of his scholarly subjects, joins in. The monarch intervenes. 
the king all says, the king all says, and I'm quoting again, stands up and tells the moderator plainly he was not satisfied in all that had been answered, but did believe a hound had more in him than was imagined. I had myself, said he, a dog that straggling far from all his fellows had light upon a very fresh scent, but considering he was all alone and had none to second and assist him in it, observed the place and goes away to his fellows and by such yelling arguments as they best understand, prevailed with a party of them to go along with him and bringing them to the place, pursued it into an open view. To put James's example in the form of a syllogism, pray makes scent, there is scent, therefore there is prey. Indeed, not only does James's dog syllogize as such, he also manages to convince the rest of the pack of his findings, which is more, it seems, than Matthew Wren had managed. How could Matthew Wren respond to this intervention without directly challenging his monarch? He did it, of course, by flattery. The answerer all right, protested that his majesty's dogs were always to be accepted, who hunted not by common law, but by prerogative. James's dogs are never just dogs. I imagine James may have enjoyed the flattery, but was simultaneously rather cross that his point was not taken seriously. Now, why am I telling you that story? I think this moment at Cambridge University opens up what are some key issues about conceptions of animal reason in the early modern period, which I'm taking to be somewhere from about 1550 to 1650. I'll probably stop at about 1635, as I usually do. Um, you can ask me why and I'll make up an answer. Um, in this stage debate from 1615, we have confronting each other a theorization of non-humans that denies them the capacity to think, set against a claim for something like animal reason that is supported by someone's actual experience of their animals. And interestingly, if you remember back to the quotation from Montaigne, even Chrysippus, the source of the image of the dog at the crossroad, was figured by Montaigne as, quote, in other things as disdainful a judge of the condition of beasts as any other philosopher, unquote. Chrysippus, Montaigne says, was enforced to confess that there might be some evidence of something like a syllogism in the dog's actions. This is really important. Even as he is opening up the way to tell us something that sounds like canine logic, Chrysippus is resisting that idea. One of the things that interests me is why might he have been disdainful and how that disdain might have impacted conceptions of animal reason in the past and potentially, as Giacomo said, coming through into the present too. So Matthew Wren had argued that the dogs nosed rather than thought things out, that they had much in their minds, mouths, but little in their minds. That is an utterly conventional conception of animal capacity that emerges out of classical ideas. And that Chrysippus supported even when he was forced to confess that sometimes it looked like something else was going on. And a key source of these ideas about animals is, as so often in these things, Aristotle. So brief introduction to Aristotle's conception of three souls. That's all I'm giving you of Aristotle, bear with me. I've even got pictures. Um, Aristotle had proposed in De Anima that there are three kinds of soul. There is the vegetative soul, uh, the sensitive soul, and the rational soul. So the vegetative soul, humans share with plants and animals, as it is the soul that guides growth, nutrition, and reproduction. So you think about it, plants do all those three things, animals do those three things, humans do those three things. So that's what we share across what we might call the natural world. There's then the sensitive soul. This is possessed by animals and humans alone and is the source of perception and movement. Now, 
we might want to wonder if heliocentric flowers are able to do movement and things like that, but Aristotle wasn't worrying about things like that. But this is that sense in which you are in a world that you can sense and you can move towards, move away and so on. The final soul that is there for Aristotle is the rational soul. This is where, this is found only in humans and it subsumes the vegetative and the sensitive souls and houses the faculties that make up reason. So we've got these three souls. The human has all three, animals have the first two, plants only the first one. Daniel Widows put it succinctly in the 1630s when he wrote, quote, all creatures are reasonable or unreasonable. They which want reason are beasts who live on land or in water. Those which live on the earth, move on the earth or in the air. Widow was a clergyman and a natural philosopher, and I can talk a bit about the word natural, uh, term natural philosophy in questions if you're interested. And this connection between religion and the study of the natural world reinforces the ways in which Aristotle's ideas were taken up in Christian theology. Aristotle's rational soul is seen as the pagan understanding of the immaterial essence that was given by God to mark humanity out as special at the moment of Adam's creation in Genesis. And in this sense, the rational soul is equated with the immortal soul, which means that not only can humans alone reason in this logic, they also alone have a place in the afterlife. Animals lacking the immaterial and immortal thing called the rational soul lack reason, but also lack access to the afterlife. In this logic, the death of an animal is a death of a purely bodily thing. And when the animal dies, that's it. It's the death of a body. Again, we can think about how theologians worried about that because some of them are more interesting ones did. Now, the immaterial essence, the rational soul that is possessed by humans, is a really complicated thing. And I love this grid because it's just, I want to write a book in which I can write something like this. These are the various faculties that you can do. So at the bottom, we've got, um, this comes from Catherine Park's essay called The Organic Soul. We've got the nutritive faculties are expulsive, digestive, retentive and attractive. So they're drawn towards you, throw them out, you get them in and so on and so forth. Um, you move to the sensitive soul, you've got the perceptual faculties, so you've got taste, touch and five senses, but you've also got the co cognitive senses that are attached to the material world. And I'll talk about them a bit more later. And then in the rational soul, she calls it the intellective soul, we've got the intellect, the will, and the memory. Different writers in this period I discovered after doing this research call it all sorts of different things. Some of them include things in different orders. It's very confusing, but there ain't no logic, but this is as close as you can get to logic, and I thank Catherine Paul for it. So the immaterial essence called the rational or intellective soul possessed by humans alone, is understood to be where intellect, the capacity to form logical thinking and so on, where memory and where will, the desire to do something, to act on something, to decide whether you should do it, morality, you might say. All these capacities of reason relied on an ability to abstract from the material world, so to move from the physical into the realm of the ideal. The human so this understanding suggested is capable of, for example, recalling something without a material prompt. Let us all practice. Let us all remember walking along a beach on a beautiful summer's day. We are not on a beach, we are not seeing a beach, we are not seeing a summer's day, but we can all somehow bring that into our minds because we have that capacity to live in the realm beyond the material. Animals, so this argument goes, we're not able to perform such acts of recollection in the absence of a physical prompt. So in one of his epistles, written in the first century of the Christian era and translated into English by Thomas Lodge in 1614, the year before James uh, visited Cambridge, Seneca wrote this. A dumb beast comprehendeth things that are present by sense he remembereth those things that are past at such time as that which awakeneth the sense awakeneth itself. As a horse remembereth himself of his way when he is set onto the beginning of it. Whilst he standeth in the stable, he hath no remembrance thereof, 
although he hath trod it over many times. So this is the logic that says the horse needs to see the road to go, ah, oh, this is that road. Whereas we can kind of all now imagine our ways home. Yeah, we don't need to be on the road to do it. So access to the abstract, to reason and therefore the capacity to deduce through logic rather than smell is what marks the human out as human. And this is perhaps why some 22 years after James's visit to Cambridge, his son Charles, then Charles I, had himself painted on the back of a very large muscular horse with, you will notice, a very small head. The image is pointing, I, I'm sure Van Dyke could paint a horse. <laughs> I absolutely am convinced he could, but he chose not to because symbolically, we have the monarch exercising not only physical strength, and look how straight his legs are. He is absolutely controlling this animal, but he's also symbolically representing his dominating reason. This horse has a tiny head for his tiny brain because he lacks the capacity to reason. This horse needs, so the logic says, a human to guide it. As a side note, we should bear in mind within this logic that has this horse with a tiny head, everything that the human stands for can be absolutely lost. All humans have within them the possibility of not exercising their rational capacity. Getting drunk, for example, is figured in this period as losing access to, or worse, willfully blotting out one's rational part. And in so doing, you are leaving only with one's, your vegetative and sensitive souls in action, and therefore you are living like an animal. So we see the logic of that. And this emerges in early modern texts. So George Gascoigne, in a book from 1576, a, a kind of attack on drunkenness, talks, says this, let me set down this for my general proposition. All drunkards are beasts. The logic being you've got this rational soul, but you have blotted it out with alcohol. And we also have these images of these men who are drunk, who've got animal heads. They literally become beastly headed. And the different kinds of animals represent different kinds of drunks. So the monkey drunk is the man who likes to dance. Um, I think it's the bear drunk who likes to tell you he loves you and kind of wants to give you a hug. Fox drunk gets cunning, and so lion drunk wants to have a fight. And they absolutely set out these different kinds of drunk. Because the logic being, if you're not being properly human, you've lost your rational soul, or you're not using your rational soul, you're becoming just a beast. And in legal terms, non compos mentis in the law means not in control of your mind. If you are born without control of your mind, that's the logic, then you are not uh, held culpable. If you are, or is it kind of lucid at times, but others at not times, the legal problem has to be, did you perform the act when you were lucid or otherwise? If you're drunk, you're liable because you have chosen to be drunk. That is the law going on in the early 17th century, which is still kind of there present in the English law today. So to return to the ability to contemplate the material world, a dog can smell, as Wren argued, and so find his master because the master had left a material trace of himself. But a human can deduce logically, that is, can apply abstract construction. If not that or that, then this. Needing no physical prompts to make or start to make that deduction. To bring this back to the capacity, remember, we can sit here in our cosy university lecture room and imagine the terror of being confronted by a wolf. A sheep, this logic goes, only knows that wolves are terrifying when a wolf stands before it, even if a wolf stands before it every single day and terrifies it every day. A sheep cannot stand in a field and imagine a wolf in its absence and from that imagining experience fear. This is the logic of this philosophy. So the construction of animal reason, or the construction of a lack of animal reason that is central to this Aristotelian perspective, in brief, is what was the scholarly orthodoxy at the time of James's visit to Cambridge. But there is, of course, more going on in the debate than that. There is Chrysippus's dog, and there is James's own dissatisfaction in all that had been answered. The king believed, according to Thomas Ball, a hound had more in him than he imagined, than was imagined. 
or to put it into the, another, the words of another royal personage from the era, there are more things in heaven and earth, Horatio, than are dreamt of in your philosophy. Now, James's interpretation of his dogs was founded on the basis of experience, of his observing one of his hounds in action. The king was being, you might say, an empirical observer. Imperia is Greek for experience. He was basing his beliefs about animals' capacity on the actual observations of those animals. That might feel like a strange thing to say to us because that's what animal science we think looks like now. In orthodox philosophical ideas of this period anyway, the theories of the classical fathers and the scriptures like the ideas of the vegetative, sensitive and rational souls dictated discussions about animal rationality in a way that left actual observation of them at the margins. So in his study, The Anatomy of the Mind from 1576, the clergyman and scholar Thomas Rogers outlined prudence, which along with justice, fortitude and temperance was one of the four cardinal virtues in ways we'll recognize. He says, prudence consisteth especially in foreseeing, foreseeing things or in preventing mischief before it come. And therein he went on, um, do we differ from brute and unreasonable creatures which have no forecast, but serve only the time present. The sheep in the field cannot prepare for the appearance of a wolf. It can only react when the wolf stands before it. It's humans who build fences to keep out the wolfish possibility. But Rogers' orthodoxy immediately comes under scrutiny. In the sentence following that claim that animals serve only the time present, he writes, and yet, we read that there is a certain providence, foresight in some beasts, as in mice and ants. It's reported that nature, by nature, this providence given to mice that before any man they will foresee the destruction of an old house and therefore before the ruin and fall thereof will leave the same and seek new habitation. The natural world of animals, even here as it is reported uh, rather than observed, enters to undermine the certainty of human difference. The mice seem to make deductions from past experience to present circumstances to plan for future actions. They seem, in short, to be prudent. Thomas Rogers' response to this danger to, the, to orthodox assumptions about animal reason is simple. Having repeated the anecdote about the mice, he writes, but let us leave the example of beasts and come to men again. Having noted the contradiction, he wants to ignore it. That, I think, is an expression of the discomfort that marks an intellectual shift that was taking place in the period. A shift made visible in James's refusal to attend a scholarly debate about dogs syllogizing and not bring his own hounds to bear. From an emphasis on following classical and scriptural precedent as the model for understanding animal reason, there was a growing recognition that in the words of Sir, uh, Sir Francis Bacon, James's Lord Chancellor, truth is to be sought for not in the felicity of any age, so not because it was in the classical period or classical writers, which is an unstable thing, but in the light of nature and experience, which is eternal. He wrote in the plan of the great instauration from 1620, I admit nothing on the faith of eyes or at least of careful and severe examination. So then nothing is exaggerated for wonder's sake, but what I state is sound and without a mixture of fables and vanity. So experiment, seeing with one's own eyes and the construction and establishment of matters of fact through the repetition of experimental outcomes emerges as the cornerstone of this new idea about knowledge. The study of Aristotle and the Bible, still important, finds itself housed slowly and surely in different disciplines. The emergence of the new science, as it's been termed, saw scholars shift their perspective, literally as well as metaphorically. So as Jonathan Sorday has shown, this can be beautifully traced through the changing place of the anatomist over the period of the 16th, 15th and 16th century. So this is a medieval anatomy class. And you can see that the senior scholar is professing meaning from above reading a book, whereas this man at the bottom is pointing to the findings of the book in the body. So the book is coming first, the body is coming second. Um, in the mid 16th century, something new began to happen. And the title page of Andreas Vesalius' De Corporis Humani Fabrica from 1543 has Vesalius, the anatomist, 
standing with the cadaver rather than above it. So he's the bearded man in the middle, standing, looking out at us, the reader, in this title page. What's interesting is, in the middle of this image of this chaotic anatomy class where people are kind of peering to see what's going on, there is one man who can see reading a book. So that is um, Vesalius with the pointy beard at the bottom by the cadaver, and above him there's a man still with a book. And I think that's there to remind us that the books don't disappear. They are still present, but they are being slowly shunted to the margins by this focus on the actual hands-on experience of the body. To return to King James and his reading of his hound's actions against Wren's claims for canine capacity to smell rather than to think, we can see this as also illustrative of the gap between a new intellectual valuing of observing the world and a long-standing um, method from philosophy. This is not to say that until this moment, the late 16th, early 17th century, everyone firmly believed that a sheep had no memory, that a horse didn't know his way home, or that a dog could not smell, uh, could smell but not think. Far from it, there are other ways of understanding the world. Indeed, one of them is present in the work that I've already quoted, that's Montaigne's Apology for Raymond Seaborn. So in that extended essay, Montaigne reflected ideas that emerged out of an alternative philosophical tradition, also grounded in classical ideas, but this time not by Aristotle, but Sextus Empiricus. Sextus's work, Outlines of Skepticism, was written during the second century of the Christian era, rediscovered during the 16th century and first printed in Latin in 1562, when Jonathan Barnes argues it made a sensation. If Bacon, Vesalius and those others were asking what there is in the world, Barnes argues that skeptics were asking, what can we think of? What can we speak about? In this context, animals and their capacities become a focus. Sextus wrote, even if we do not understand the sounds of the so-called irrational animals, it's nevertheless not unlikely that they do converse and we do not understand them. So it's suddenly our failure to understand rather than their failure to communicate. The sceptical point here is that we do not understand. To say that animals, because animals are not understandable to us, means they're not making meaning, is to say the least extraordinary egocentric. This sense of anthropocentrism, the putting of the human at the centre of ways of understanding, was core to Montaigne's take on Sextus's work. He wrote, Presumption is our natural, human's natural and original infirmity. Of all creatures, man is the most miserable and frail, and therewithal the proudest and disdainfulest. It is through the vanity of the same imagination that he dare equal himself to God, that he ascribeth divine conditions unto himself, that he selecteth and separateth himself from out of the rank of other creatures. How knoweth he? by the virtue of his understanding, the inward and secret motions of beasts. By what comparison from them to us that he conclude the brutishness he ascribeth unto them? And he comes to what, for me, is my favourite philosophical question ever. I realise I haven't read all the philosophy bits myself. Like philosophical question. When I'm playing with my cat, he asks, who knows whether she have more sport in dallying with me than I have in gaming with her. We entertain one another with mutual apish tricks. If I have my hour to begin or to refuse, so hath she hers. Montaigne's challenge, like James's, emerges from interactions with a real animal. This is not theorising in a library. It is thinking, you might say, in a world. Hamlet said there are more things in heaven and earth, Horatio, than are dreamt of in your philosophy, but there are also, of course, more things in this world than philosophy. And I want finally to turn away from the debates among intellectuals, <laughs> scholars and monarchs to think about how we might understand what the people on the ground, those who are working with the animals were doing, how they were imagining their animals. Of, the, of course, these people's lived experience were informed by ideas filtering down through, for example, the Bible. They had to go to church, for example. But their day-to-day -day experiences made a massive difference to their understanding of their animals. They may have believed they didn't go to heaven, these animals. They may have seen them as being for human use, 
but they also recognize them, I suggest, as thinking beings with ways of understanding the world that it was sensible for those humans who were working with them to have some comprehension of. In short, people knew their animals thought, and knowing this was central to how they managed to get along with them. So I'm going to show how this is made visible through a focus on one particular engagement, women's relationship with their dairy cows, because these one-to-one -one encounters are an utterly prosaic part of early modern life in uh, many households. Having a cow meant having access to highly nutritious foodstuffs like cheese. These are really important animals. But this relationship goes beyond the functional. I think cows were expensive and they were vital creatures to be um, kept. And therefore keeping them in good health was really important. Therefore you pay attention to your animals. We also know from works such as this by Leonard Maskell that cows will live well 15 years, he says, but after that she will bear feeble and weary. These days, dairy cows last for about three years. So you keep a cow for 15 years. This is the car you really look after, yeah? Except it's also gonna speak back to you. A car doesn't necessarily speak back to you. Where Montaigne pondered his cat's experience and Dave James's hounds, these women were aware of their cows and what they found there were, just as Montaigne found with his cat, Animals who want, might want to end the encounter before their human was ready, who might be disruptive, who might have preferences that needed to be recognised. They knew their cows had thoughts and they worked with them on that basis. Now, it might come perhaps as a no surprise, but I was prompted to undertake this research after I'd encountered some animal welfare scientists at a conference in Florence. It's like the perfect combination for a Renaissance animal historian. Um, these people have trained in the post baconian methods of welfare science, have gone beyond thinking about the minds of wild animals to thinking about the emotional lives of farm animals. The, domestic modern, the modern domestic cow, the argument goes, may be a product of centuries of human interference, but that cow, despite or perhaps better because of this, has her own world, her own way of being in the world, and her own welfare needs must reflect this. And so at the conference, I heard talks about many things, including how the position of a sheep's ears might convey the animal's emotional state, about cow relaxation. And these papers made me think, they would have known this back then, in the early 17th century. They would have recognised animals' minds, their feelings, their moods, and so on, because they might just live with one or two cows for a very long time. This was a known being. It was a neighbor, a co-worker. It was a member of the family. Tracing this relationship is not as easy as tracing philosophical ideas. The vast majority of husbandmen and laborers were illiterate in this period, and as were an even larger proportion of women. And the cows, they didn't write so well either. So these people left very little record and to trace their understandings or understanding of their interactions with animals, we need to think a bit more laterally than we did with the philosophers to find out what they thought and what they knew about what their animals thought. So we go to dairy manuals. In a dairy book for good housewives from 1588, Bartholomew Dow's speaker, uh, books were often written in dialogues, even agricultural manuals in the kind of shadow of the platonic dialogue, recalled that on his large dairy farm, quote, I've also had this experience, that one of my kind cows have had such a mind and fantasy to one of my mates that in her presence, the cow would never stand to be milked of any other but of her only. The cow is choosing her milker. They are, you might say, exercising their agency in the process of milking. A good dairy maid would adjust their work to fit in with their cow's wishes. In another housewifery manual that's published in 1615, the year James visited Cambridge, Gervais Markham wrote that the woman, quote, shall not settle herself to milk nor fix her pail firm to the ground till she see, till she see the cow stand sure and firm. Once again, gaining the cow's agreement was vital to successful milking. And the routine of milking might also include music. Dow noted, if your milking maids be disposed to sing in time of their milking, some cow will take such a delight therein, that afterwards when a maid cometh to milk her and doth not sing, she will not stand to be milked. 
So what emerges just from these manuals is a sense not of the instrumentalization of the animals alone. Cows, of course, were objects of use. That's not to be questioned. What also comes through is a sense that their role as participants in and also as guides to the process. There is a sense that the thought behind cheese making is not only human. And this becomes clear, perhaps, when things go wrong. So this is a ballad dating from 1629, which tells of the chaos that follows when bickering spouses swap their roles on the farm. So the normal role would be the woman does the dairy and the chickens, the man's further out in the fields. The wife in the ballad fails miserably in her attempts to sow the fields. And the husband, of course, fails in the dairy. And this is why he fails. And I think it's worth thinking about. So there's a little passage in this ballad that says, he went to milk one evening tide, a skittish cow on the wrong side. His pail was, was full of milk, God what? She kicked and spilt it every jot. Besides, she hit him a blow of the face, which stamped was whole in six weeks space. So the woman, the ballad implies, knows how to cope with a skittish cow. She knows which is her wrong side, and she avoids it. She is an expert in this domain and her expertise comes from knowing the animal, from working with her day in, day out. She has experience and that experience is built on an acknowledgement that this cow too is engaged in the partnership. She, the cow, is also thinking about milk. So the joke in the ballad is on the man who believes that working with a cow does not require hands-on experience, does not include the negotiation with another mind. You kind of get the sense that this man enters as the Aristotelian and gets a kick in the face from a cow. So when thinking about a history of animals, capacity to think for themselves, about what early modern thinkers thought that animals were thinking, we find ourselves shifting between different perspectives. The logic that had come down through the scriptures and through the classical greats still held sway, but it was being challenged not only by the reappearance by, of works by other classical authors like Sextus Empiricus, works that challenged the dogmatic orthodoxy, but the view of dogs' lack of capacity to perform syllogisms proposed by Matthew Wren was also being challenged by a reevaluation of the experience of being with animals in the world. There was a move, you might say, from the library towards the hunting field, from the debating chamber of Cambridge to the farmyard. And what was clear was that the people in the fields and the yards were already fully aware of their animal's capacity. It was the intellectuals who were catching up. Finally, in 15, 1637, the same year Van Dyck's portrait of Charles I was painted, René Descartes published his, uh, his, uh, described his attempts to arrive at his own new science. The Discourse on the Method, his book, takes his readers through the rules of his new system and outlines for the first time his beast machine hypothesis. Descartes proposed, and I'm giving you this very briefly, that animals were automata. That just as it's not intelligence, he wrote, but nature that acts in animals according to the disposition of their organs, and I'm quoting, in the same way a clock consisting only of wheels and springs can count the hours and measure the time more accurate than we can with all our wisdom. A clock does not know the time. It merely records it. And likewise, an animal, the Descartes, does not know it lives. It merely persists. The modern philosopher and translator of Descartes, John Cottingham, has succinctly summarised Descartes' view. He writes, quote, I should certainly say that cats feel pain but not that they have the kind of full mental awareness of pain that is needed for it to count as a cogitatio of a thought, unquote. That is, a, an animal can experience torture, but somehow cannot properly feel it because it doesn't have a mind that can feel torture. An animal's response to an apparently painful stimulus in this Cartesian perspective is in external movements alone, quote, which occur and not in pain in the strict sense. That's John Cottingham. It's a logical outcome of Descartes' ideas. But Antoine Legrand, writing a defense of Cartesian ideas about animals, could say in 1675 that an animal's memory operates, quote, in the same manner as folds in paper or linen render the said paper or linen the more apt 
to re-edit the same folds as before. Think about that, that is extraordinary. To say this is to reject out of hand ideas about canine syllogizing, feline play, bovine skittishness that were present in the earlier discussions. But the Cartesians did not wipe out those ideas. And in his general system of horsemanship, first published in French in 1657, William Cavendish, the Earl of Newcastle, one of the great horse trainers of this period, asked an ob obvious question of Cartesian philosophy. How can one teach a horse if it is a machine? If an animal has no capacity to think, to develop understanding over time, and if it has only a limited and not a full experience of pain, how can teaching, which for him often involved the use of the whip as much as the voice, how can that teaching work on that creature if it cannot feel that pain? For Cavendish, the answer to such a question was to assert with some certainty that Descartes was wrong. And this is a quote from Cavendish. A horse must be wrought upon by proper and frequent lessons than by the heels, that he may know and even think upon what he ought to do. If he does not think, quote, uh, as if he does not think, brackets, as the famous philosopher Descartes affirms of all these, um, uh, end bracket, it would be impossible to teach him what he should do. But by the hope of reward, fear of punishment when he has been rewarded or punished he thinks of it and retains it in his memory for memory is a thought and forms a judgment by what is past of what is to come which again is a thought in so much that he obeys his rider not only for fear of correction but also in hopes of being cherished but all these things are so well known to a complete horseman that it is needless to say more on the subject and this is that uh, William Cavendish on his horse. The horse is looking particularly pleased with himself because um, he's thinking, and I'll stop there. Mm -hmm.